mythology from around the world describes strange creatures. Some of these creatures sometimes appear to be hybrids, others though equally as strange in appearance are thought to be a natural species of intelligent beings. Our ancestors were believers and were regularly writing about strange supernatural beings. Many of these beings were humanoid creatures. Modern day science is only just, in the past 50 years or so, beginning to discover and understand that in the ancient world there was more than one species of Homo sapien. Recent archaeological discoveries and new methods of examining old evidence have forced many experts to admit that a re-examination of much of our ancient history is necessary. The vast majority of textbooks used by education systems around the world are outdated and have since been proven wrong. What makes a species human what makes human beings different to animals? The word Homo sapiens is from Latin word, Homo meaning human being and sapiens, meaning wise, sensible, judicious. Homo sapiens is the only extant human species, all of whose members are of the subspecies Homo sapiens sapiens. Intelligence The ability to walk upright on two legs are the most obvious characteristics. The ability to use and control fire, make art, weapons, and clothing also separate Homo sapiens or human beings from animals. Neanderthals also known as Homo neanderthalensis or Homo sapiens neanderthalensis are the most well known of these alternative human species. Neanderthals lived in temperatures that are believed to have regularly reached as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius, to survive they wore clothes made from animal skins. Like modern day humans Neanderthals come in many shapes and sizes, however there are some differences. Neanderthals lived and were adapted to live in the cold. In general, they possessed relatively short lower limb extremities, compared with their upper arms and legs, and a broad chest. Their arms and legs would have have been thick and heavily muscled. This body build would have protected the extremities against damage from cold stress. There is much debate about what they ate. An international team of researchers sequenced the DNA from hardened plaque on the teeth of five Neanderthal specimens from three different sites across Europe and analyzed the results to try to unravel long-running mysteries about Neanderthal's diet and health. The five Neanderthals included two individuals from El Citron Cave in Spain, two found in the Spy Cave in Belgium, and one individual from Bruel Grotta in Italy. Their findings are illuminating, and demonstrate dramatic geographic differences in the Neanderthal diet. For instance, the Neanderthals who lived in what is now Belgium apparently ate plenty of meat, including woolly rhinoceros and wild sheep. However, the Neanderthals from El Cidron, Spain, showed zero signs of meat consumption, instead they got nourishment from foods like pine nuts, moss, and mushrooms gathered from the forest. The study adds another layer to Neanderthal history, 
which to this day has significant holes that confound scientists. They also wore jewelry, and had an understanding of the medicinal value of certain plants, this is known due to an individual at Cueva del Cidron, Spain. Seems to have been medicating a dental abscess using poplar which contains salicylic acid. The active ingredient in aspirin and there were also traces of the antibiotic producing penicillium tens of thousands of years before Dr. Alexander Fleming used a strain of penicillium to develop the first antibiotic, revolutionizing modern medicine in 1928. Not much is known about their ability to speak, some argue that the oversized noses may have prevented or at least hindered speech. In 1971, cognitive scientist Philip Lieberman reconstructed the Neanderthal vocal tract as similar to that of a newborn and incapable of producing nasal sounds. Because they had a large mouth and thus lacked the necessity for a descended larynx to fit the entire tongue inside the mouth. The 1983 discovery of a Neanderthal hyoid bone used in speech production in humans in Kabara 2 which is almost identical to that of humans suggests Neanderthals were capable of speech and the ancestral Sima de los Husos hominins had human-like hyoid and ear bones, which could suggest the early evolution of the modern human vocal apparatus. However, the hyoid does not definitively provide insight into vocal tract anatomy. Neanderthals are now usually believed to be much closer to modern-day humans than any living ape. They shared many traits with modern-day humans and were sexually compatible with modern-day humans and cross-breeding is believed to have taken place. They buried the dead and some researchers even believe they may have held funeral-like ceremonies. As well as sharing some of our acknowledged traditions they are also believed by some to have shared some of our darker ones. Cadernus Labzia Loxico de Lax, Coruna. 2001 Volume 26, page 457 Cave Bear Worship in the Paleolithic. The concepts in the interpretation of the archaeological findings are based on excavations in the caves of the Alps during the first decades of the 20th century, where the remains of cave bears were detected. The excavators got the impression that the arrangement of the fossil bones could hardly be due to nature, so they attributed this to the activities of Homo neanderthalensis who were assumed to have killed the animals and arranged their bones during certain ceremonies. In historical and even recent times nearly everywhere in the Arctic, primitive peoples knew about rituals connected with the hunting of the bear. The first excavators of the caves, Emil Backler and Carl Horman, took 
These ceremonies of circumpolar peoples to prove their hypothesis of an ancient bear cult in prehistoric times. Neanderthals were carnivores, it is believed that their diet that consisted primarily if not exclusively of meat. There is also evidence that Neanderthals practiced cannibalism. The reasons for cannibalism are disputed with many historians and History.com claiming Neanderthals resorted to cannibalism in the face of climate change, when they lost their source of food. They took desperate measures to survive. History.com explain a new study by researchers in France suggests that around 120,000 years ago, when a period of sudden climate change wiped out many of the animals who made up their food supply. Some Neanderthals resorted to cannibalism. In the 1990s, the remains of six Neanderthals were found in baumet muligercy a small cave in the Rhone Valley in southern France. The remains, which belonged to two adults, two adolescents, and two children, showed many of the telltale signs of cannibalism. According to Cosmos, the bodies had been completely dismembered, and the bones showed both cut marks left by stone tools and bite marks resembling ones left by Neanderthal, rather than animal. Teeth evidence of suspected Neanderthal cannibalism is not new. In addition to the remains found at Muligarsi, researchers have also uncovered bones bearing the signature marks of cannibalism at sites in Belgium. Spain and Croatia, though the Croatian remains were later shown to have been damaged by natural processes. Modern human's genomes show past interbreeding with at least two groups of archaic humans, Neanderthals, and Denisovans, comparisons of the Denisovan, Neanderthal, and modern human genomes has revealed evidence for a complex web of interbreeding among these lineages. Denisovans or Denisova hominins appeared and lived across Asia during the Lower and Middle Paleolithic potentially surviving as late as 14,500 years ago. The Red Deer Cave people of the Guangxi region China are the most recent known prehistoric archaic human population. Fossils dated to the Baling Alarod warming, between about 14,500 to 11,500 years ago. A partial skull of a cave dweller was found in Longlin Cave in the Guangxi region of China. Evidence shows large deer were cooked in the Red Deer Cave, giving the people their name. On the 14th of March 2014 National Geographic explain. A previously unknown type of human jut-jawed, heavy-browed, deer-eating cave dwellers may have been identified via Stone Age bones from southern China, 
according to a controversial new study. The mystery human fossils might even represent an entirely new species that existed alongside our own as recently as 11,500 years ago, according to a team of Chinese and Australian researchers. Or the fossils might represent an especially early migration of so-called modern humans out of Africa and into East Asia, the team suggests. Or as some critical scientists have said the evidence may tell us something we already know, people come in all shapes and sizes. We have discovered a new population of prehistoric humans whose skulls are an unusual mosaic of primitive features, like those seen in our ancestors hundreds of thousands of years ago. Evolutionary biologist Darren Curnow of the University of New South Wales, said via email. In short, they're anatomically unique among all members of the human evolutionary tree, added Curnow, a co-author of the new study of the Red Deer Cave people. Published online today in the journal PLOS1. The study was principally based on the remains of at least three individuals from Maludong, or Red Deer Cave, in Yunnan province, MAP, fossils that had been excavated in 1989 but hadn't been studied. Until now among the human remains was an abundance of bones from an extinct species of giant deer suggesting the cave people were hunters with a taste for venison. The red deer cave dwellers unusual features included a flat face, a broad nose, a jutting jaw that lacked a chin, large molar teeth, a rounded brain case with prominent brow ridges, and thick skull bones the researchers say. That date would make the red deer humans even more recent than the famous Homo floresiensis from the Indonesian island of Flores itself a disputed potential human species. Discovered in 2003, the Flores hobbits are dated to no later than 13,000 years ago. Homo floresiensis, Flores man nicknamed Hobbit, is a small species of archaic human which inhabited the island of Flores, Indonesia. NationalGeographic.com explain. At first, the skeleton looked like a child's. Uncovered in the gaping Liangbia cave on the Indonesian island of Flores. The female hominin would have stood just 3 foot 5 inch tall in life. But she wasn't a youngster, and it soon became clear that the short statured hominin was something special, a never before seen species, which the researchers dubbed Homo floresiensis. The find, announced in 2004, ignited a debate that has since raged over how this curious hominin and other similar remains, known as the hobbits, fit into our family tree. A new paper, published today in the journal Science, is the latest chapter in what study author Richard E. Green calls, the great mystery that is the hobbit. Green a computational biologist at the University of California, Santa Cruz, along with an international group of colleagues, examined the genetic material of the modern Rampasasa pygmy group, who live near the cave where the hobbit was found. They were curious whether the hobbit's DNA lives on in these modern, short people. Long story short, the answer is, no, says Green. 
Having looked hard, we don't see any, any evidence for that. Instead, it seems. Groups of Flores residents developed short stature at least twice the evolutionary adaptations separated by tens of thousands of years. In March 2019 AncientOrigins.net Listed 11 mysterious human species that most people don't know existed, the list included. Homo nailed the evidence of Homo nailed was unearthed in 2013 in a cave in South Africa by cavers who were able to access a chamber in the rising star system for the first time. 30 meters, 98 feet, below the surface, it is strewn with thousands of bones which have unique and interesting features with 1,550 currently excavated and many more remaining in the cave. Some of their features are archaic and resemble specimens from around 2 million years ago, but they also have more modern hominid features, and their bones have been dated to about 250,000 years ago. It has been concluded that they were not a direct ancestor of modern humans. Penhuman another extinct human found in 2008 was Homo tseacangensis, which has the catchier nickname Penhuman. Penhuman's fossilized mandible was discovered by fishermen working near the Penhu Islands off the coast of Taiwan. It is extremely thick and has gigantic teeth, which has puzzled scientists for several reasons. They have been able to determine it is the mandible of a previously unknown species and that it was probably very similar to Homo erectus, but larger. It has so far not been possible to date the fossil, so they are not sure when the species was alive. Boskop Man was discovered in 1913 in Boskop, South Africa. It is notable as the brain size of the skull was larger than that of a modern human. After other specimens of the species were discovered, it was given the name Homo capensis. However, after heavy criticism in the 1950s there was a change of opinion and the Boskop man along with the rest of Homo capensis was reclassified as anatomically modern Homo sapiens and not an extinct ancestor at all, despite an estimated head size of 30% larger than the modern average. These strange and unexplained humanoid fossils are clear evidence that multiple species of human walked the ancient earth in some cases at the same time. This opens up many other questions, questions like, what happened to these humanoid species? How intelligent were these species? How many different species of human existed?
The Lowenmensch figurine or Lion Man of the Hollandstadel is a prehistoric ivory sculpture discovered in the Hollandstadel, a German cave in 1939. According to Ulm Museum in Ulm, Germany, it has been determined by carbon dating of the layer in which it was found to be between 35,000 and 40,000 years old and therefore is associated with the archaeological orignation culture of the Upper Paleolithic. Lion Man is associated with the orignation culture and is the oldest known anthropomorphic animal figurine in the world. According to the The Rise of Homo Sapiens, The Evolution of Modern Thinking, by Frederick L. Coolidge, Thomas Wynne. A similar but smaller lion-headed human sculpture was found along with other animal figurines and several flutes in the nearby Vogel herd cave. This leads to the possibility that the Lowenmensch figurines were important in the mythology of humans of the early Upper Paleolithic. Archaeologist Nicholas Conard has suggested that the second lion figurine lends support to the hypothesis that Aurignacian people may have practiced shamanism and that it should be considered strong evidence for fully symbolic communication and cultural modernity. The figurine lay in a chamber almost 30 meters from the entrance of the Stadel cave and was accompanied by many other remarkable objects. Bone tools and worked antlers were found, along with jewelry consisting of pendants, beads, and perforated animal teeth. The chamber was probably a special place, possibly used as a storehouse or hiding place, or maybe as an area for cultic rituals. The lack of a mane suggests the figure represented a female, potentially a goddess. Similar goddess were spoken about thousands of years later in ancient Egypt. Sikhamet is a warrior goddess as well as goddess of healing. According to the complete gods and goddesses of ancient Egypt, she was also depicted as a lion-headed woman. Sikhamet was considered the daughter of the sun god, Are, and was among the more important of the goddesses who acted as the vengeful manifestation of Ra's power, the Eye of Are. Sikhamet was said to breathe fire, and the hot winds of the desert were likened to her breath. She was also believed to cause plagues, which were called her servants or messengers, although she was also called upon to ward off disease. Tefnet was a lion-headed deity of moisture, moist air, dew, and rain in ancient Egyptian religion. Mahis was an ancient Egyptian lion-headed god of war. Pake meaning she who scratches was a lioness goddess of war. Narasimha is a Hindu god he is also depicted as a lion-headed man, he is believed to be the fourth incarnation of Vishnu. Vishnu is one of the principal deities of Hinduism and is revered as the supreme being in Vaishnavism. Other avatars of Vishnu include Krishna, Parshurama, Rama, and Gautama Buddha. Jain texts also mentioned Rama as 8th Balabhadra among the 63 Salakapurasas meaning illustrious or worthy persons illustrious beings who appear during each half time cycle. The Jain universal or legendary history is a compilation of the deeds of these illustrious persons. 
Their life stories are said to be most inspiring. Narasimha, killed Hiranyakashipu who is also depicted as a lion-headed human, his name literally translates to clothed in gold and is often interpreted as depicting one who is fond of wealth. In the Puranas it is stated the name was derived from a golden throne called Hiranyakashipu, the Asuras sat in or nearby during the Atiratra, Soma, sacrifice. Lord Vishnu takes the form of Narasimha in his fourth incarnation, the previous one being that of a boar, Varha. Vishnu kills the demon Hiranyaksha during his Varha avatar. Narasimha is often visualized as half man slash half lion, having a human-like torso and lower body, with a lion-like face and claws. This image is widely worshipped in deity form by a significant number of Vaishnava groups. He is known primarily as the great protector who specifically defends and protects his devotees in times of need. Hiranyaksha's brother Hiranyakashipu wants to take revenge by destroying Lord Vishnu and his followers. He performs penance to please Brahma, the god of creation. Impressed by this act, Brahma offers him anything he wants. Hiranyakashipu asks for a tricky boon. That he would not die either on earth or in space, nor in fire nor in water, neither during day nor at night, neither inside nor outside, of a home, nor by a human, animal or god, neither by inanimate nor by animate being. Brahma grants the boon. With virtually no fear of death he unleashes terror declares himself as God and asks people to utter no God's name except his. However his son Prahlada, who a devoted worshipper of Lord Vishnu, refuses. Repeated pressurization on him yields no results for Hiranyakashipu. Prahlada declares the omnipresence of Lord Vishnu. Once Hiranyakashipu points to a pillar and asks if Vishnu is present in it. Prahlada nods in affirmative. Angered at it, he draws his sword and cuts the pillar, Lord Narasimha appears out of the broken pillar. Lord Narasimha, being a man-lion god form, kills Hiranyakashipu. He comes out to kill at the twilight, neither day nor night, on the doorsteps of his palace, neither inside nor outside, uses his nails to kill, neither animate nor inanimate. Puts him on his lap before killing, neither earth nor in space. Thus making power of the boon ineffective. Venus of Willendorf is an 11.1 cm tall Venus figurine estimated to have been made about 30,000 years ago. It was found on August 7, 1908, by a workman named Johann Verin or Joseph Baram during excavations conducted by archaeologists Joseph Zombathy, Hugo Obermeyer and Joseph Bayer at a Paleolithic site near Willendorf, a village in Lower Austria near the town of Krems. 
Many similar figures have been unearthed as far away as Siberia, and distributed across much of Eurasia. The Venus of Hodelfels also known as the Venus of Skeklingen was unearthed in 2008 in Hodelfels, a cave near Skeklingen, Germany. It is dated to between 40,000 and 35,000 years ago. Like the Lion Man statue it also highly resembles some mother goddess figurines created thousands of years later in ancient Mesopotamia. As well as the seated woman of Kittelhoyuk which was unearthed by archaeologist James Mellart in 1961 at Kittelhoyuk, Turkey. When it was found, its head and hand rest of the right side were missing. The current head and the hand rest are modern replacements. The sculpture is at the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations in Ankara, Turkey. It is believed to be approximately 8,000 years old. In the 1920s, Peruvian archaeologist Julio Tello first discovered tombs in Paracas, Peru filled with skeletons who possessed some of the largest elongated skulls found on Earth. Since then, many more elongated skulls from this region have been unearthed which are believed to date from around 3,000 years ago. In 2013, Researcher L.A. Marzoli, biologist Brian Forrester and a team of researchers began working on a scientific understanding and explanation to these ancient Paracas elongated skulls. Some of their initial DNA analysis revealed that the elongation was not just caused by artificial cranial deformation but rather by genetics with some of the elongated skulls cranial volume being up to 25% larger and 60% heavier than conventional human skulls. This means that they could not have been intentionally deformed through head binding or flattening, as cranial deformation can change the shape but does not alter the volume or weight of a skull. In Los Angeles at the Elongated Skull Symposium, L.A. Marzoli, Brian Forrester, and their team of researchers announced some new DNA test findings. Biologist Brian Forrester, who actually lives in Paracas and who unearthed some of these elongated skulls, gives the following information regarding the latest DNA results. The DNA results actually were incredibly complicated it's gonna take me some time to actually figure out what the results mean. What it does show for sure is that the Paracas elongated skull people were not 100% Native American. They were a mix or even you could say, in some ways, a hybrid of different people. Their blood types are very complicated as well, they should be blood type O if they're 100% Native American and that's not the case. We are likely looking at a subspecies of humanity as regards to the Paraca seems to be a lot of DNA evidence from extreme Eastern Europe and extreme Western Asia. More specifically I'm talking about the area in between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea where ancient elongated skull people lived I think about 3000 years ago. 
So I think we are looking at a migration pattern starting in the Caspian Black Sea area and then entering through the Persian Gulf and then moving eastwards eventually winding up on the coast of Peru. So that's the hypothesis I'm developing now. Ten of the Paracas elongated skulls blood were tested and they should be 100% typo because that is Native American, but it's turning out high percentages of type A. A small percentage of type B. Very high percentage of type AB and less than half is O. So the Paracas were an incredibly complex ethnic mix of people there are a number of different haplogroups that were found in the DNA. Tests of the Paracas elongated skulls and these haplogroups, which is your genetic ancestry, they don't fit in with the history of Peru in any shape or form. It appears that the largest elongated skulls on the planet have been found, A in Paracas. Peru and B in the Caucasus area in between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea so my theory is that there was a subspecies of human which we are going to be eventually calling Homo sapiens sapiens Paracas, and they were living in the area in between the Caspian and Black Sea. They were invaded by somebody and so they were forced to flee. By studying the wind and currents of the oceans I've been able to come up with the following concept they moved southwards until they found the Persian Gulf and then they sailed down through the Persian Gulf and once they left that area the boats were probably taken by the prevailing currents and winds which would have taken them eastward into the Pacific Ocean. Over the course of a period of time, maybe tens of years or hundreds of years. They began to breed with people in the Pacific and that's why we're getting such a complicated reading of blood types they made it to Tahiti. From Tahiti they were able to sail south to New Zealand and then once they hit New Zealand they were able to catch the Humboldt current that took them up the coast of South America. They were looking for a good harbor to land their ships or boats and when they hit the largest natural bay on the coast of Peru which is Paracas. That's where they stopped and that's where they decided to establish themselves because almost nobody was living there at the time. Over the course of time they had to breed with local native people. Otherwise their bloodline would become too concentrated eventually they found Paracas probably about 900 BC and they lived in relative peacefulness in 100 AD the invasion of the Nazca people. Happened from the north and when the Nazca entered the area, they slaughtered the elongated people who were the only royal class of people. We had three medical experts with us. Dr. Malcolm Warren, chiropractor, Rick Woodward, anthropologist, and Dr. Michael Alday, medical doctor, and all three of them stated quite emphatically that because of the abnormalities found with some of the elongated skulls from the Congo Cemetery in Peru they have no other choice but to state that some of these ancient Paracas were a subspecies of humanity it had to be genetic, they had to be born with these abnormalities. They had dark red hair. The royal Paracas were the ones with elongated heads, not the common people the royal family of the Paracas. They lived in subterranean underground houses and I think the reason for that is that they had light colored skin, probably sensitive eyes because of the extreme sunshine. These strange oversized skeletons are not exclusive to Peru. Native Americans talk of the CT cot, sometimes called Sejica. In the official history of Morrow County and Ohio, 
1880 we read. In 1829, when the hotel was built in Chesterville, a mound nearby was made to furnish the material for the brick. In digging it away, a large human skeleton was found, but no measurements were made. It is related that the jawbone was found to fit easily over that of a citizen of the village, who was remarkable for his large jaw. The local physicians examined the cranium and found it proportionately large, with more teeth than the white race of today. The skeleton was taken to Mansfield, and has been lost sight of entirely. Henry Howe's Howe's Historical Collections of Ohio, Vol. 2, Part 1, published in 1907, gives a similar report of the bones of giants being found inside of pyramidal mounds. In Seneca Township, Noble County, Ohio, was opened, in 1872, one of numerous Indian mounds that abound in the neighborhood. This particular one was locally known as the Bates Mound. Upon being dug into it was found to contain remains of three skeletons, whose size would indicate they measured in life at least eight feet in height. The remarkable feature of these remains was they had double teeth in front as well as in back of the mouth and in both upper and lower jaws. Upon exposure to the atmosphere the skeleton soon crumbled back to Mother Earth. According to the Paiutes, the Sitika were a red-haired band of cannibalistic giants. The Sitika and the Paiutes were at war, and after a long struggle a coalition of tribes trapped the remaining Sitika in Lovelock Cave. When they refused to come out, the Indians piled brush before the cave mouth and set it aflame. Sitika were burned alive inside the cave. The cave eventually collapsed blocking the entrance. The legend of the red hair giants began to spread in 1883 when Sarah Winnemucca, daughter of Chief Winnemucca, wrote the first known autobiography by a Native American woman called Life Among the Paiutes. Their Wrongs and Claims In her book Winnemucca discusses a tribe of barbarians that she says were known as the People Eaters who lived along the Humboldt River and who would waylay her people and eat them. She states the following in her memoirs. My people say that the tribe we exterminated had reddish hair. I have some of their hair, which has been handed down from father to son. I have a dress which has been in our family a great many years, trimmed with this reddish hair. I am going to wear it sometime when I lecture. It is called a morning dress, and no one has such a dress but my family. In the autumn of 1911, a group of miners led by David Pugh and James Hart began digging out 250 tons of bat guano to be used as fertilizer when they began to discover countless well-preserved prehistoric artifacts. The University of California was notified and eventually sent out L.L. Loud in the spring of 1912 to conduct archaeological excavations at what is now known today as Lovelock Cave. In archaeologists Loud and Harrington's book Lovelock Cave 
Is this photograph of a humanoid looking skeleton they unearthed that is similar to the humanoid and elongated looking skulls found in Paracas, Peru? A 15 inch sandal, a bowl that weighed 200 pound, bags made from rabbit skins, feathers used for decorative purposes were among the many items found inside the cave. Richard J. Dewurst, researcher and Emmy Award-winning writer and author of the book The Ancient Giants Who Ruled America, says the following. Recently it has been confirmed that four of the ancient skulls unearthed at Lovelock Cave are, in fact, in the possession of the Humboldt Museum in Winnemucca, Nevada. According to Barbara Powell, who is the director of the collection, the museum is prohibited by the state of Nevada from putting the skulls on public display because the state does not recognize their legitimacy. They are instead kept in the storage room and shown to visitors from all over the world only by request. In addition, Powell said that additional bones and artifacts were transferred to the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology in Berkeley, California where they are kept but also never put on display. What is significant to note is that the scientific community has assiduously scrubbed all references to the six to eight foot tall, red-haired skeletons found at the site. As will be seen, this repeated effort to clear the historical record of all references to a pre-Indian Caucasian culture in the United States can be seen as working in harmony with the NAGPRA policies of the federal government, which works on agendas based on political correctness and not objective science. Explorer, author, and co-creator of the Watchers film series, L.A. Marzulli makes the following statement. The question is why would men of science deliberately engage in this? And, I believe I have an answer. If skeletons exist, and by all of the overwhelming evidence both from the written record found in newspapers and accounts from scientists, as well as the oral traditions from Native Americans, they pose a direct threat to the pervading worldview, Darwinism.
In 1963 in the town of Derinkuyu in the central Anatolia region of Turkey, a resident found a mysterious room behind a wall in his home. Further digging revealed access to a huge underground tunnel network now known as Derinkuyu Underground City. It is large enough to have sheltered as many as 20,000 people together with their livestock and food stores. It is the largest excavated underground city in Turkey and is one of several underground complexes found throughout Cappadocia. The city had important areas for everyday uses and the production of food such as wine and oil presses, stables, cellars, storage rooms, refectories, a school, studies and chapels. Unique to the Derinkuya complex and located on the second floor is a spacious room with a barrel vaulted ceiling. The underground city ranges from one or two level multiple levels that go as deep as 60 meters. The age of the caves is debated Dr. Heinrich Kusch believes the caves are about 12,000 years old. Some experts claim they are more like 2,000 to 3,000 years old and were still being expanded on as late as the 5th to 6th century. The oldest written source about underground structures is the writings of Xenophon who was born 430 BC. In his Anabasis he writes that the people living in Anatolia had excavated their houses. Underground, living well in accommodations large enough for the family, domestic animals, and supplies of stored food. Similar underground cities have been found all over Turkey and European countries like Germany, Austria, and Scotland. On the 6th of December 2018 a Scottish newspaper called The Herald reported. It has remained out of sight for an unknown length of time and has aquatic species living within that are believed to never have seen daylight. But two Scots have discovered what is believed to be the country's longest cave after coming across the nettle-choked entrance by chance as they explored the area. Geologist Ian Greek of Aberdeen and Neil Menzies from Stonehaven were exploring an area about two miles south of Durness in Sutherland last June. Around 500 yards from the road in the Northwest Highlands Geopark, a geological area which is home to a number of limestone caves. They stumbled across an innocuous looking entrance which was blocked by vegetation. The experienced cavers believe that it could directly to the world-renowned Smo Cave near the village which is a distance of around four miles away. When the men entered what has now been called the Cave of the Black Stones, they found the way blocked by silt but it was heading northwards towards Smoke Cave, following the course of River Dionard. Experts have long believed the thin line limestone rock which is flanked on either side by harder rocks has had the potential to be full of cave formations as surface water drains straight through the soil even in the heaviest rain. Now a team of cavers is to mount an expedition to drill through the silt which will allow them to explore the system in full. But during the initial visit they discovered a fresh water eel which they believe has never been exposed to sunlight. Mr. Grieg, 34, said, we were not expecting what we found. It was full of nettles and less than a meter wide. We managed to enter it and there was a section of boulders, we moved them out of the way and then there was a 17 feet drop. 
That led to a spectacular chamber 15 yards by 16 feet, big enough to stand up in. The stones were blue and purple. It was some incredible sight. We managed to explore 150 yards before finding the route choked with sediment. We plan to return with the team in the new year to dig it out and explore further. The theory and hope is it could extend all the way to Smo Cave which would make it by far the longest cave in Scotland and with the most spectacular of entrances, or exits. Depending on the start point, at Smoo. Scotland's longest cave is currently the Cave of the Sloping Rock in nearby Ascent which is 1.782 miles long. The longest cave system in the UK is the Three Counties system in the Yorkshire Dales, with 53.9 miles of passageway. While the longest in the world is the appropriately named Mammoth Cave in Brownsville, Kentucky with more than 400 miles explored. Smoke Cave is the largest coastline cave in the British Isles and has provided shelter for thousands of years. It is believed to have been a Stone Age home more than 5,000 years ago with Norse settlers later gathering here to repair boats and fish for herring. It has one of the largest entrances to any sea cave in Britain at 50 feet high. It was formed by a burn that runs down into the rear chamber, as well as erosion caused by the sea. Mr. Greek added, if it links up to the new discovery it will be one of the best caving experiences in the UK. It is a treasure trove for geologists. Over the two days we have explored the new cave we even found a white freshwater eel which has never seen sunlight. The drought helped us because the cave floods in wet conditions, and up to the roof in places. It's like a big treasure hunt, but we do not know what the treasure is yet. It is what most cavers dream of. This is the final frontier of exploration in Scotland. Every inch of the country has been mapped by satellite, it's what remains under the surface that remains the big mystery. Fellow caver Colin Coventry, who for more than 30 years has led tours at Smo Cave, added, For many years I have been convinced that Smo was linked to one long cave. We believe the biggest cave in Scotland is here and waiting to be found. This looks like it. But it is spectacularly dangerous. I would certainly not take tours there. However this is one of the most exciting finds for many years. Some researchers believe that these underground cave systems may have even combined and linked with each other creating a giant cave system that could have potentially covered many parts of Europe. German archaeologist Dr. Heinrich Kusch said evidence of the tunnels has been found under hundreds of Neolithic settlements all over the continent. In his book, Secrets of the Underground Door to an Ancient World, he claims the fact that so many have survived after 12,000 years shows that the original tunnel network must have been enormous. In Bavaria in Germany alone we have found 700 meters of these underground tunnel networks. In Styria in Austria we have found 350 meters, he said. Across Europe there were thousands of them from the north in Scotland down to the Mediterranean. Most are not much larger than big wormholes just 70 centimeters wide, just wide enough for a person to wriggle along but nothing else. They are interspersed with nooks, at some places it's larger and there is seating, 
or storage chambers and rooms. They do not all link up but taken together it is a massive underground network he added. Who built these tunnels remains a mystery as does how they built them at a time that machinery was not available. Researchers seem to heavily disagree about the date of their construction but whether they were built 2000 or 20,000 years ago is debatable. The amount of work that must have went in to build these cave systems and the impressiveness of them is not. Like many other ancient structures and artifacts that are found around the world the cave systems do not match our perceptions of the past. Why did people want to live underground? Were our ancient ancestors facing something of threat on the surface? Some researchers theorize that there could have been a war on the surface, the caves may have been used in the Byzantine period, between the 5th and the 10th centuries, and are believed to have continued to be used by the Christian natives as protection from the Mongolian incursions of Timur in the 14th century. Greek, a history of the language and its speakers Jeffrey Horrocks writes. Nonetheless, at the beginning of the 20th century, Greek still had a strong presence in Scilly northwest of Konya, ancient Iconian. In Pharisa and other villages in the region drained by the Yenis River, some 100 kilometers south of Caesarea, ancient Caesarea, and in Cappadocia proper. At Arab Ison, Arapsu slash Gols here, northwest of Nevs here, ancient Nyssa, and in the large region south of Nevs here as far down as Nigd and Bor, close to ancient Tyana. This whole area, as the home of Saint Basil the Great, his brother Saint Gregory of Nyssa and his friend Saint Gregory of Nazianzos, was of great importance in the early history of Christianity. But is perhaps most famous today for the extraordinary landscape of eroded volcanic tufa in the valleys of Gorm, Ilora, and Sogan. And for the churches and houses carved into the fairy chimneys to serve the Christian population in the Middle Ages. Many of the rock-cut churches, which range in date from the 6th to the 13th centuries, contain magnificent frescoes. Away from the valleys, some of the villages have vast underground complexes containing houses, cellars, stables, refectories, cemeteries and churches. Affording protection from marauding Arabs in the days when the Byzantine Empire extended to the Euphrates, and serving later as places of refuge from hostile Turkish raiders. The most famous of these are at Kamakli and Derinkuyu, formerly the Greek villages of Anaku, Inigi, and Malakopi, Melagob where the chambers extended down over several levels of depths of up to 85 meters.
One of the most contradicting pieces of evidence to the mainstream narrative is also one of the oldest. An apparent 400 million year old hammer discovered embedded inside the rock in Texas the London. In June 1936, Max Edmund Hahn and his wife Emma Zadie Hahn were walking along Red Creek, near their home in London, Texas, USA. When they spotted a rock nodule with a piece of wood sticking out from it. It was sitting on a ledge by a waterfall on the river, not attached to any of the solid rocks around it. There are several areas where small waterfalls exist on Red Creek, the closest being about 10 kilometers southwest of London. Sometime later, perhaps in 1946 or 1947, their son George broke it open, to reveal a metallic hammerhead in the center of the nodule, to which the wooden handle was attached. Part of the broken nodule has survived and has an unfossilized mollusk shell partly embedded in it. Inside the nodule was a metallic hammerhead, to which the wooden handle was attached. Archaeology, world.com explain. The inner handle underwent the carbonization process, the hammerhead was constructed with iron purity, and this is only possible with modern day technology. According to research by the Metallurgical Institute of Columbia. According to analysis, the head of the hammer consists of 97 pure iron, 2% chlorine, and 1% sulfur. This curious artifact was discovered in the city of London, Texas, USA, in 1934. The hammer appeared embedded inside a rock and since its discovery, there have been many theories about its origin, and most importantly its incredible age. So how did the hammer end up embedded inside the rock? Well, for the hammer to finish inside the rock, it had to have been built before the rock was formed and that would be several million years ago according to live science. After its discovery and due to all the questions the hammer raised, researchers decided to abandon the incredible discovery in the Somerville Museum, in Texas. According to studies of the Metallurgical Institute of Columbia, the inside handle underwent the process of carbonization. According to analysis, the rock encasing of the hammer was dated to the Ordovician era, more than 400 million years ago. The portion of stone surrounding the hammerhead also presented abnormalities, seeming to have merged with some type of sheath covering the hammer. According to geologists, the slow process of petrification dates back hundreds of millions of years. This has led several ufologists and ancient astronaut theorists to a quick deduction of the context of the incredible discovery leading them to assume not only that there was a human civilization. Before the historical process of petrification in Texas, but that this ancient civilization already possessed the necessary technology for the fabrication of a hammer with modern features. Evidence suggesting that the iron from the hammer might have originated from a meteorite is not a possibility according to researchers. The chemical analysis of the artifact also detected certain amounts of potassium, silicon, chlorine, calcium, and sulfur. Thus, this composition contradicts the hypothesis postulated that the hammerhead belonged to the fragment of a meteorite since the bodies of our solar system do not have that type of chemical composition like the 100 million year old screw and the Russian microchip the hammer is totally dismissed by most researchers
They question the age of the rock that it is embedded in and claim it is probably no more than a couple of hundred years old. Other evidence that goes against the official narrative is much harder to ignore or dismiss. Photographs of a large finger were captured in 1988, and at the time they were published in one of the leading newspapers in Europe. The finger was said to be of a mummified humanoid and 38 centimeters long. It was found by a grave robber who was said to have discovered the huge finger when he was searching a tomb in Egypt that has not been disclosed. Entrepreneur Gregor Spori wanted to buy the finger from the owner and made a good offer, but the owner said that he would not sell it. Spori said that the grave robber has a certificate to say that the finger was authentic and he also had an x-ray of the finger. Spori said that the finger was in a package that was oblong and it had a very musty smell to it. When he told the story about the finger in 2012, he said that he'd been very surprised when he had been shown the dark brown, huge finger. He went on to say that he had been allowed to pick it up and that he was also allowed to take photographs of the giant finger. Spori said that a bill had been placed at the side of the finger so that a comparison in size could be got and the finger was bent and split open, and it had been covered in mold that had dried. Once Spori left Egypt he decided that he would like to find out more about the giant finger and he set about trying to find where the body belonging to the finger was located. He made his way back to Egypt in 2009 and went looking for the man who owned the finger, but he could not find him. All that remains of the giant finger are photographed. The Paluxy River, also known as the Paluxy Creek, is a river in the U.S. state of Texas. It is a tributary of the Brazos River. It is formed by the convergence of the North Paluxy River and the South Paluxy River near Bluffdale, Texas in Arath County and flows a distance of 29 miles before joining the Brazos just to the east of Glen Rose, Texas in south-central Somerville County. Wikipedia explain many dinosaur track quaddies and footprints have been discovered in the riverbed, some as early as 1908. Most tracks in the area were found in Cretaceous limestone. The Paluxy River became famous for controversy in the early 1930s when locals found dinosaur and supposed human footprints in the same rock layer in the Glen Rose Formation, which were widely publicized as evidence against the geological time scale and in favor of young Earth creationism. However, these anachronistic human footprints have been determined to be mistaken interpretation or hoaxes. What Wikipedia failed to mention is some of these human tracks are actually inside the dinosaur tracks or side by side them. But Wikipedia do acknowledge that the dinosaur tracks are real dinosaur footprints and most tracks in the area were found in Cretaceous limestone. Dr. Don Jones of Columbia Union College, Tacoma Park, Maryland, has a number of tracks whose origin is reported as the Paluxy River. The collection includes a right and left human footprint, 
a pair of three-toed dinosaur tracks, and a large cat print. All of these, in separate blocks, appear to be in the same type of limestone. They also have a single human track of inferior quality that is in a limestone of a different color and texture from that of the other prints. One of the three toed dinosaur tracks and both types of man prints have been cross sectioned. In each instance the rock layers end abruptly at the edge of the track, indicating that they are not the result of a foot stepping into soft mud but are produced by carving. Both Morris and Neufeld admit that these prints were carved during the Great Depression. Neufeld says, Local old-timers in the Paluxy River area tell that the tracks were both excavated and carved as a source of income during the Depression years. Both of these collections the Burdick prints and the Columbia Union College prints may well be carvings of that period. The trouble with the carving theory is obvious, not only would it have taken a lot of time to carve human footprints into dried limestone, it would have also taken the right tools and a level of skill that most people do not possess. Some claim that the human footprints may have been made millions of years after the dinosaur prints. But a problem with that theory is how would the dinosaur footprints remain in wet limestone for millions of years? Rain would have washed them out. Other theories include random natural and erosion patterns resembling human footprints, trace fossils of burrows of small invertebrates, severely eroded or partial tracks, and other impressions known to occur in dinosaur track quadis caused by different body parts. Despite all these ideas and theories put together by people that feel the need to rationalize and explain these footprints, the fact remains that they look convincing. There does not seem to be broken sharp edges like one may expect with a carving. Or lighter colored fresher looking stone it looks to many like the apparent human footprints that walk on the same track as confirmed dinosaur footprints are exactly what they appear to be. If they are legitimate human beings or at least humanoid beings footprints they are among the best pieces of evidence that suggests that humans and dinosaurs may have coexisted. But the ancient footprints found in Texas are not even the most baffling footprints found. This strange and gigantic apparent footprint was discovered in 1931 by a farmer called Stoffel Kutzi. While hunting, it is one of the most controversial sites in archaeology and geological research. 
The footprint is located in a remote area about 300 km due east of Johannesburg in the eastern Transvaal near the South African town of Mpulazai, also sometimes spelled Mpalyazi, in Pumalanga. Granite forms miles below the surface of our planet. Which means that the footprint was made below the surface of Earth and over the course of hundreds of thousands of years has been pushed up through natural various geological processes. The original footprint, which would have been horizontal, was uplifted and tilted to its current vertical position. Robert M. Schock PhD is a skeptic on his website robertshock.com he explains. Reinforcing my first impression that this was nothing more than a natural erosional feature is the fact that the rock face on which it occurs is covered with other weathered out cavities. One of which reminded me of the silhouette of a small snowman. Had not only a giant stepped into the granite, but a meter tall snowman leaned against the granite as well, impressing the outline of his body onto the rock surface. Granite forms many kilometers below the surface of our planet, so apparently the giant and snowman were miraculously strolling through a hot, dense magma composed of melted rock down in the bowels of Earth. It was all a bit too fantastic for me. However, might it just be possible that my geological instincts were wrong, and this was a genuine footprint of a giant? Forget the snowman, as no one else seemed to recognize it as anything more than a natural feature, it was the footprint that received all of the attention. Even Michael telling her, the foremost proponent for the authenticity of the footprint, admitted that he would be hard pressed to explain how a giant could be striding through molten granite several kilometers below the surface. He had another explanation, which he shared with us. An old time miner had related that when quarrying granite, sometimes a powdered form of the rock could form a wet, slushy, mixture that would congeal and harden as a type of cement. Telling or hypothesized that a giant, or giants, in ancient times was carrying out mining operations in the granite, stepped into a wet pulverized granite slurry, sort of a mud of powdered granite. And later the granite slurry dried, reconstituted itself, and preserved the impression of the footprint. He noted that at the top of the footprint one could even detect the mud that oozed between the toes and was pushed up by the foot of the giant. This presumably happened in very ancient times, possibly a couple of hundred thousand years ago, and since then, through various geological processes, the original footprint, which would have been horizontal, was uplifted and tilted to its current vertical position. Robert M. Schock concludes by saying, If I am correct in my assessment that the footprint occurs in genuine granite, and I am 100% certain that this is the case, then there is no conceivable possibility that it really is the footprint of a giant or any other living creature. So what is the footprint as I already related, my first impression was that it is nothing more than a natural erosional feature. This is still my first hypothesis. Although I cannot totally dismiss the possibility that it was either artificially carved into the rock or that it may have initially been a natural weathering feature that only vaguely looked like a footprint originally and was subsequently enhanced and retouched by humans to turn it into a full-fledged footprint. Arguing against the possibility that it was either carved in full or in part is the fact that I could not find any evidence of tool marks on the surface of the granite. 
However, the granite surface is highly weathered. One could hypothesize that it is a sculpted form, but extremely old, perhaps thousands of years old. The earth was such a different place back then. The atmosphere lacked free oxygen. The highest life forms that we know of from that early period were microbes, which in some cases formed photosynthetic bacterial layers or mats. There is no evidence of giants on earth back then, that is, unless you accept the single giant footprint found in the Mpulazi batholith. Robert M. Schock seems to be unaware that similar footprints have been found in many places in the world. And evidence of giants on Earth has been widely reported by local and national American newspapers, throughout the early parts of the 20th century. Giants exist in the folklore of almost every known culture that has come before us, they're biblical. And it is a provable fact that prehistoric animals were much larger than their modern-day counterparts. Examples include elephants that are significantly smaller than their prehistoric ancestor the woolly mammoth. The same is true with rodents, crocodiles, sharks, penguins, birds, insects, and apes. Gigantopithecus is an extinct genus of ape from the early to middle Pleistocene of southern China, represented by one species, Gigantopithecus blacki. A giant a male estimated to weigh up to 300 kilograms. Though experts only have teeth and pieces of jaw to work off they believe it stood at about 9 feet tall and it was to be argued to be a hominin, a member of the human line. But it is now thought to be closely allied with orangutans, classified in the subfamily Pongani. If most species that are alive today had much larger distant relatives then surely the same would most likely apply for human beings. So we have written evidence in the form of old newspapers and books as well as ancient texts. Fossilized evidence in the form of giant bones, some of which are not allowed on display due to not being recognized by the respective state of the museum, skulls and alleged footprints. And scientific evidence in the form of fossilized records demonstrate that as time progresses most animals have become smaller. Most scientists put this down to a change in atmosphere at some time in the planet's history. One theory is the atmosphere of prehistoric Earth was more suited to larger species. As the atmosphere slowly changed over millions of years the larger species either become smaller or totally died out. On the November 24, 2011 the Daily Mail reported, is this an alien skull? Mystery of giant-headed mummy found in Peru. Skull has soft spot, found in infants, yet also two large molars, found in older humans three anthropologists agree, 
it is not a human being. A mummified elongated skull found in Peru could finally prove the existence of aliens. The strangely shaped head almost as big as its 50 centimeters body has baffled anthropologists. It was one of two sets of remains found in the city of Andahuaylas in the southern province of Quispicanchi. The skeletal sets were discovered by Renato de Vila Requelme, who works for the Privado Ritos and Dinos Museum in Cusco in southeastern Peru. He said that that the eye cavities are far larger than normally seen in humans. Davila Requelme said three anthropologists, from Spain and Russia, arrived at the museum last week to investigate the findings and agreed it was not a human being and would conduct further studies. He added, although the assessment was superficial, it is obvious that its features do not correspond to any ethnic group in the world. The remains of an eyeball in the right socket will help determine its genetic DNA and clear up the controversy if it is human or not. The second mummy is incomplete and is only 30 centimeters. It lacks a face and seems to be wrapped in a layer as a placenta, fetal position. The remains bear a striking resemblance to the triangular crystal skull in the 2008 Indiana Jones film Kingdom of the Crystal Skull which turned out to be of alien origin and have supernatural powers. The alternative explanation for the bizarre discovery is that the skull was artificially deformed as part of a tribal ritual. The practice of skull elongation to signify group affiliation or social status dates back 9,000 years. Common in various tribal cultures around the world, such as Mayans, North American natives and Australian Aborigines, the head molding styles fell into three groups, flat, round, or conical. To achieve the desired shape, the head was wrapped in tight cloth. In the case of cranial flattening, the head was placed between two pieces of wood. The technique would usually be carried out on an infant, when the skull is at its most pliable. The cloth would be applied from a month after birth and be held in place for about six months. Peru contains some of the most impressive ancient structures seen anywhere in the world including Machu Picchu, Nazca, Alentadamboa pre-Inca fortress. With rock walls of tightly fitted blocks weighing between 150 and 250 tons each end. Sacsayhuaman whose ruins also include a 500,000 gallon water reservoir, storage cisterns, ramps, citadels, and underground chambers. The stone block Sacsayhuaman was built are estimated to weigh from between 50 tons to over 300 tons. April Holloway of AncientOrigins.net explains. Caracas is a desert peninsula located within the Pisco province in the Inca region, on the south coast of Peru. It is here where Peruvian archaeologist, Julio Tello, made an amazing discovery in 1928, a massive and elaborate graveyard containing tombs filled with the remains of individuals with the largest elongated skulls found anywhere in the world. These have come to be known as the Paracas skulls. In total, Tello found more than 300 of these elongated skulls, which are believed to date back around 3,000 years. A DNA analysis has now been conducted on one of the skulls and expert Brian Forrester has released preliminary information regarding these enigmatic skulls. The geneticist that conducted the DNA analysis was Brian Forrester he wrote on his Facebook page. 
Whatever the sample labeled 3A has came from, it had mtDNA with mutations unknown in any human, primate or animal known so far. The data is very sketchy though and a lot of sequencing still needs to be done to recover the complete mtDNA sequence. But a few fragments I was able to sequence from this sample 3A indicate that if these mutations will hold we are dealing with a new human-like creature, very distant from Homo sapiens. Neanderthals and Denisovans accounts of the giants of Peru date back to at least the 16th century, when Spanish conquistadors were penetrating into this uncharted, unknown land seeking to tame and control it. One such early account was written of by explorer and conquistador Pedro Cesar de Leon, in his Tome Royal Commentaries of the Incas. Volume I. He wrote that the natives of the region told of a time when massive giants came one day to their shores upon enormous and crude reed rafts to land at the peninsula of Santa Elena after which they apparently set up a camp and dug extremely deep wells for water. These giants were said to be epically proportioned, and De Leon described them. Some were so big that an ordinary man of good size scarcely reached up to their knees. Their members were in proportion to the size of their bodies, and it a monstrous thing to see their enormous heads and their hair hanging down about their shoulders. Their eyes were as large as small plates. They say they had no beards and that some of them were clad in the skins of animals, and others only in the dress nature gave them. There were no women with them. On reaching this point, they set up their camp like a village, and even in these times there is a memory of the sight of their houses. As they found no supply of water they remedied the lack by making some very deep wells, a labor certainly worthy of record, being undertaken by such strong men as these must have been. To judge by their size, they dug these wells in the living rock until they came to the water, and afterwards they built the wells in stone from the water line upwards so that they would last for ages. In these wells the water is excellent and it is always so cold that it is very pleasant to drink. He reports that according to the natives these giants then went on a bloodthirsty rampage, raiding villages and devouring anything they could get their hands on, including human beings. In the 17th century, and similar account comes from Jesuit priest and missionary Pablo José Arriaga, who wrote of a curious finding in his 1620 manuscript The Extirpation of Idolatry in Peru, in which he says, They took us to the other side of the village, about a quarter of a league, where a very large cave was, and in it many dead Gentiles. And among them were three bodies of giants with deformed heads dressed in cum by ceremonial cloth, but rotted with time. These giants are the progenitors of all this people, whom they worshipped and revered, there were many traces of human sacrifices, they the official inspectors burned the bodies in the village. Strange stories of giants are spoken about in every continent in the world. Ancient structures whose very existence seems to totally debunk the mainstream narrative also stand in every continent in the world. Their construction or purpose in many cases is a mystery and seems far beyond the expected capability of people who according to the mainstream possessed no knowledge of electricity and had no machinery to aid them build.
Some researchers believe that a 1.8 billion years old nuclear reactor in Oklo, in Africa's Gabon may be one of the oldest known object to be made by what would have had to have been an advanced species. Janice Friedman of AncientCode.com explains. In 1972, a worker at a nuclear fuel processing plant noticed something suspicious in a routine analysis of uranium obtained from a mineral source from Africa. As is the case with all natural uranium, the material under study contained three isotopes three forms with different atomic masses, uranium-238, the most abundant variety, uranium-234, the rarest, and uranium-235, the isotope that can sustain a nuclear chain reaction. For weeks, specialists at the French Atomic Energy Commission CEA, remained perplexed. Elsewhere in the Earth's crust, on the Moon and even in meteorites, we can find uranium-235 atoms that make up only 0.72% of the total. But in the samples that were analyzed, which came from the Oklo deposit in Gabon, a former French colony in West Africa, the uranium-235 constituted only 0.717%. That small difference was enough to alert French scientists that there was something very strange going on with the minerals. These little details led to further investigations which showed that at least a part of the mine was well below the standard amount of uranium-235. Some 200 kilograms appeared to have been extracted in the distant past, today, that amount is enough to make half a dozen nuclear bombs. Soon, researchers and scientists from all over the world gathered in Gabon to explore what was going on with the uranium from Oklo. What was found in Oklo surprised everyone gathered there. The site where the uranium originated from is an advanced subterranean nuclear reactor that goes well beyond the capabilities of our present scientific knowledge. Researchers believe that this ancient nuclear reactor is around 1.8 billion years old and operated for at least 500,000 years in the distant past. Scientists performed several other investigation at the uranium mine, and the results were made public at a conference of the International Atomic Energy Agency. According to news agencies from Africa, researchers had found traces of fission products and fuel wastes at various locations within the mine. Incredibly, compared with this massive nuclear reactor, our modern-day nuclear reactors are not comparable both in design and functionality. According to studies, this ancient nuclear reactor was several kilometers long. Interestingly, for a large nuclear reactor like this, thermal impact towards the environment was limited to just 40 meters on the sides. What researchers found even more astonishing, are the radioactive wastes that have still not moved outside the boundaries of the site. As they have still held in place thanks to the geology of the area. What is surprising is that a nuclear reaction had occurred in a way that the plutonium, the byproduct, was created, and the nuclear reaction itself had been moderated. This is something considered as a holy grail of atomic science. The ability to moderate the reaction means that once the reaction was initiated, it was possible to leverage the output power in a controlled way. With the capacity to prevent catastrophic explosions or the release of the energy at a single time. 
Researchers have dubbed the nuclear reactor at Oklahoma a natural nuclear reactor but the truth about it goes far beyond our normal understanding. Some of the researchers that participated in the testing of the nuclear reactor concluded that the minerals had been enriched in the distant past. Around 1.8 billion years ago to spontaneously produce a chain reaction. They also found that water had been used to moderate the reaction in the same way that modern nuclear reactors cool down using graphite cadmium shafts preventing the reactor from going into critical state and exploding. All of this, in nature. However, Dr. Glenn T. Seaborg, former head of the United States Atomic Energy Commission and Nobel Prize winner for his work in the synthesis of heavy elements. Pointed out that for uranium to burn in a reaction, conditions must be exactly right. For example, the water involved in the nuclear reaction must be extremely pure. Even a few parts per million of contaminant will poison the reaction, bringing it to a halt. The problem is that, no water that pure exists naturally anywhere in the world. Several specialists talked about the incredible nuclear reactor at Oklo. Stating that at no time in the geologically estimated history of the Oklo deposits was the uranium sufficiently abundant uranium-235 for a natural nuclear reaction to occur. When these deposits were formed in the distant past, due to the slowness of the radioactive decay of U-235. The fissionable material would have constituted only 3% of the total deposits, something too low mathematically speaking for a nuclear reaction to take place. However, a reaction took place mysteriously, suggesting that the original uranium was far richer in uranium-235 than that in a natural formation. Much debate continues about the nuclear reactor's creation with the narrative being it was created by nature and is just a remarkable natural occurrence. Some researchers disagree and claim that this ancient nuclear reactor was made by something that was probably much more advanced than we are today. The mainstream narrative is the human race is right now at the peak of knowledge and technology and most civilizations, cultures and people that come before us were not much not advanced than cavemen. Information and findings of archaeological evidence that contradicts the mainstream narrative is oppressed, concealed, and sometimes airbrushed from history. When the evidence is too big too high they attempt and usually fail to rationalize it. Most people believe the mainstream narrative, it is designed to be believable and create a feeling of knowledge and even control. They argue that a cover up of this scale would involve literally thousands of people, why would so many archaeologists lie to follow the mainstream narrative? The answer is the same as the answer to many questions, money. The minute that a qualified professional with a PhD or similar qualifications legitimizes one of these claims or even studies it with an open mind, they risk falling into the category of a pseudo-archaeologist or even worse a conspiracy theorist. A change of mind could lose them funding and literally put their livelihoods at risk. Due to this many archaeologists are hesitant to listen or even consider ideas that do not line up with Darwinism. Being skeptical is healthy but there is a difference between being skeptical and being narrow-minded.